Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining me for another Science Scoop. So this evening, I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Kessens, and she's a senior lecturer at the School of Product Design at the University of Canterbury, and she's going to discuss with us protein crystallization in space. So Sarah, I'm good evening. <laughs> good evening, Sarah. And I met with Sarah earlier this month at the University of Canterbury, and it was absolutely fascinating to hear and to see some of the work she's carrying out in New Zealand. So Sarah, as you'll probably find by the accent, is US born and she's however a New Zealand scientist and biochemist. She's a multinational champion in rowing and was in the top 50 applicants out of over 18,000 in the NASA astronaut program and she's been with us in New Zealand for seven years came for two years and as I said to her earlier this evening Sarah you're going to need a visa to leave and we're not going to let you have one and she did sort of realize I was possibly joking but more seriously Sarah has earned degrees in plant and molecular biologies she's worked on a plant-based HIV vaccine and she's now working at the cutting edge of synthetic biology solutions to combat climate change facilitate space colonization and advanced innovations in medicine and agriculture. In short, she's figuring out what we'll eat on Mars. Another way of describing Sarah's work is developing synthetic biology solutions to combat climate change, facilitate that same space habitation and advanced innovations in medicine and agriculture. This is very important work. It is biotech using space and she uses her work whilst educating and inspiring future leaders to courageously tackle scientific and societal challenges with purpose, integrity, and empathy. So, Sarah, after that enormous introduction, <laughs> I want to hear all about what you're doing, and I know that our listeners will want to hear about it too. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. It's really lovely to be here tonight. We've got... Um, before we go into delving into the process of the protein crystallization space, can you start off and just say to us, you know, what is protein crystallization? Because for over 150 years, scientists from all around the world have been immersed in the science. So what exactly is this process? Absolutely. So I'll dig into just a little bit of some of the many things that we do in my lab. So I'm uh, as you said in your introduction, my background is in plant biology and biochemistry and synthetic biology. So a lot of the things that we try to do in our lab is understand molecular processes that happen in organisms. So um, I'm really passionate about plant biology and over the last couple of years, fungal biology and understanding how those processes work. Um, and within those processes, uh, really important are proteins, which do a lot of the work uh, in a cell. Um, so these are, I mean, everything from the, the proteins in our hair, so structural proteins, to the enzymes that metabolize the sugars in our bodies, um, to antibodies, which are involved in immune system. So a range of different proteins that do a range of different things in both our bodies and in the plants in our agricultural systems in the, the diseases that are out there. So proteins are really, really important. And so I know you had uh, Peter Mace and Kurt Krauss on a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so they did a really great introduction to structural biology and why structural biology is important. So I'll just uh, really quickly, so this is a, a nice little structure of a protein um, that's called PHA synthase. So this is actually uh, a, an enzyme that can polymerize uh, bioplastics, basically. So it can, um, can be an enzyme that's in bacteria actually making bioplastics. But in order to understand how this enzyme works, we need that structure. And one of the ways that we get these structures is with protein crystallization. And I know uh, Peter and Kurt uh, were, were really talking about cryo-EM, which is an amazing technique that's really just come into its own uh, over the last couple of years. But the majority of proteins that we have these really high level structures for uh, have been solved using protein crystallization. And sort of how we, we get these uh, protein crystal structures is we, we take a protein, we purify it, um, and then we let it come together in this very defined way. So it forms a crystal, sort of like you know salt crystal or a sugar crystal. So it's this repeated lattice of the protein. 
Um, and then, uh, so we, we get these beautiful crystals and then we shoot x-rays at them and kind of destroy them. Um, and then there's a lot of math involved. And then eventually that leads to these really nice structures um, that we can then understand the, the function and the form of that protein with these, these, with these structures. So with the structure and ha actually having the structure, a physical structure or that you can see or understand what it is, could you just perhaps explain a little bit why that's so important in your work? Absolutely. So it's important across a whole range of sectors. So again, every living organism has proteins in it. Um, so if we want to understand how to make bioplastic, if we want to um, not rely on petroleum products for making plastic, if we want bugs to do this, we have to understand what these structures are. Um, so it's important for environmental um, understanding how to, to make things in biotech. Uh, really important in biomedical applications. Uh, so COVID obviously hasn't been good for a lot of things, but it's been really helpful for uh, understanding structure biology to the, the general public. Um, so Kurt and Peter talked about the spike protein, but there's many different proteins in that COVID virus. And so understanding the structures of those different proteins can allow us to create new antivirals, new antibodies, new drugs against those viruses. And you know that's not only viruses, it's bacteria, and not only human uh, and biomedical applications, but agricultural diseases or agricultural uh, problems that we may have or environmental problems. So if we can understand the proteins involved with cowrie disease, um, we can help um, eradicate some of these diseases. So uh, a whole broad range of where structural biology and protein crystallography is important. So this, um, the bioplastics, I mean, that's made not from fossil fuels, as you call them, not, no, not from oil, but actually from what? Uh, so these are actually made from the things that bacteria eat. So um, in this case, uh, sugar. So a lot of the organisms that we grow in the lab, so bacteria and fungi, uh, essentially grow off of sugar. So that could be, you know, purified sugars, or um, we can also sort of train bacteria and organisms um, to eat different waste products as well. But that's a whole nother uh, wow. field of research. Um, this is uh, one of uh, the, the enzymes that my, my colleague Ali here in the School of Product Design studies. So tell me, um, look, protein crystallization space. What's the point? Yes. How did it come about? Why are you doing it? Um, yeah, off you go. Uh, absolutely. Um, so as, as Kurt and Peter had talked about last week, um, protein crystallization is really hard. Uh, there's a, a whole range of things that you have to get exactly right in order to get a really nice detailed protein structure. And the first step of that is actually crystallizing the protein. And we have been doing this protein crystallization for, you know, for many, many years now. Um, but we, we've gotten a lot of the sort of the low hanging fruit, the easy proteins to crystallize. And so a lot of the, the targets that we're looking at now are very, very difficult to crystallize. And basically, um, when they started the, the space shuttle programs in the US and, and Mir and the, the space stations over the last um, sort of 20 years or so, uh, we figured out that we can actually get proteins to crystallize much easier in microgravity. So, so here on Earth, getting a protein crystal um, you get sedimentation, you get impurities within your crystals. But when we go up into microgravity, uh, we can get much bigger crystals and much higher quality crystals without sort of that sedimentation with gravity sort of forcing down on these uh, on these proteins. Well, you know, do we have any um, protein crystallization currently happening in space? So there are some facilities for protein crystallization in space. So JAXA, the, the Japanese uh, space agency, has a, a protein growth facility up there. Um, it's fairly low throughput. Um, so you can't do a whole lot of experiments at any one time. Um, and there's there's limited um, sort of a, ability to do more, uh, I guess, uh, more technical experiments. Um, so there, there are absolutely facilities up there, um, but they're not exactly fit for purpose going forward. So are you able to share with us some of the work that you're doing on this, so almost said in the space, but that would be a pun, uh, <laughs> with your module without going into too many details? Obviously, we don't want trade or scientific secrets. Ah. What can you tell us? Absolutely. So again, you know, some of those facilities that are currently on the International Space, space Station uh, are quite big and bulky. 
Um, so obviously, if you're going to space, um, mass and volume are big parts of going up into space. The more mass and the more volume that you have, the more expensive it will be. And then the more astronaut time you need, also the more expensive it will be. And so there's a very few and limited number of people that can actually do experiments on the International Space Station right now. And so what we're trying to do is create new opportunities and more opportunities for sort of your both your everyday scientists. So we've got you know hundreds of researchers here in New Zealand that depend on protein structure data. So we can we can allow some you know New Zealand researchers to get research and, and proteins up there, but then also pharmaceutical companies. Um, so there's just limited amounts of research that we can do in the current facility. So what we're doing is miniaturizing, so really lowering the mass and the volume of these, these experimentations, uh, creating real-time data. So basically being able to understand in real time how these protein crystals are forming um, and then automating any, everything so that we don't have to have astronauts uh, manipulating these experiments. So we're, we're basically taking the, the crew time, which is quite expensive, out of the equation. Um, and so the, the facility that we're developing will be able to screen hundreds of thousands um, of, uh, of protein crystallization conditions um, over the course of, you know, of sort of, you know, a mission or two. So this is essentially becoming uh, mechanized or automated so that um, certainly in terms of the cost of sending a human, but there's also the health and safety issues too. But I have to say um, the sort does deal with that, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, uh, obviously, uh, space is still hard. Um, and so we want to be able to, to send up only what we need without any sort of extraneous um, mass or volume or, or people if, if we don't necessarily need them up there. You must really want to be up there too. <laughs> Absolutely. I would love <laughs> to be an astronaut. That uh, really combines my, my passion of, of teamwork uh, and science and adventure all into one career. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty cool job if you can get it. Well, look, uh, is it where does New Zealand sit in this in this um, position really in in terms of this sort of work, this biotech work in space? So really, just getting started. Like I said, we have some phenomenal biotech industry and academics and CRI labs that are doing some really great work, especially in that structural biology space. Um, and we have a really great space industry. Obviously, we're one of a dozen nations that have capability to get into orbit. Uh, we've got lots of up and coming companies like Dawn Aerospace and Kia Aerospace. So we're really building that aerospace technology and we're really building the, the biotech technology. Um, this is sort of the first time that New Zealand has been able to combine both of those, those high value sectors. Um, so like I said, we're really just getting started. We've got a lot of capability in both. It's just getting more people involved in this this biotech and space space. I gave a lecture today at Auckland University and uh, one of the points I, I mentioned is the light-handed regulatory system that New Zealand Space Agency has, but we're getting so busy in terms of space that people would like everything sped up a wee bit. And I guess that's, a, that's absolutely appropriate to the work that you're doing and those who can help you to get these experiments undertaken in space. Exactly. Like I said, the, the New Zealand community and the space agency have been nothing but supportive. And so I'm really excited to see us develop this work. Um, and like I said, it has been very much a team effort. Um, so there are about half a dozen different companies here in Christchurch uh, that have been involved in the project. And then we have our partners with Axiom Space um, for actually getting things to the, ex the International Space Station. Yeah, I've heard great reports about New Zealand Space Agency, and it's not not often that we get that about some of the government agencies. But it's great <laughs> to hear that. And if they're listening, just keep up that good work. Remember, there's a lot more coming through, so make sure you get everything done well and fast. Um, look, are there any other comments that you'd like to make, Sarah, about about uh, our position in this and where the opportunities are for New Zealand and actually for the world as well? Absolutely. Like I said, it's a fairly new industry, um, which is really exciting because there's a lot of things that we can do. And what excites me the most is seeing our rangatahi, seeing our, our young people really come into this um, and that they can start at that forefront. And so as we get this sector developed in New Zealand, seeing young people coming through our programs here at Canterbury and Auckland and our engineering programs and biotech programs, um, I really see them as being able to grow this industry 
um, both for, you know, again, the research sector and then the commercial sector as well. It's really exciting for me to be a part of it and, and help young people into this sector. Well, that's great. Thank you, Sarah. Some of us um, can actually remember the first successful moon landing of, of human. So, <laughs> so for us, it's, it's very exciting and to think that New Zealand is part of it. And thank you, Sarah, for choosing to be with us in New Zealand because we need people like you and thank you for, for the work you're doing. I was blown away by your enthusiasm as well as by your competency and I know you're a very valued member of the team at the University of Canterbury and no doubt the entire sci uh, science and, and space community in New Zealand. Thank you so much and, and really thank you for your support. That's it, it takes the whole community in Aotearoa to be able to succeed so I really appreciate your support. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry about that slight technical issue we had there where the one camera stopped working, but there we go. We got through it, didn't we? Absolutely. We didn't give up. Well, thank no. you very much. Okay, good night, Sarah, and thanks everyone for joining us and, and staying with us. Thank you. Thank you so much.